Hi, welcome back to Central Line. I'm your host, Katie Berlin, and we have a guest today who's been on the podcast before, um, Dr. Renee Rosinski. Welcome back. Thank you very much. I'm glad to be back. The first time you were here, you were with uh, Dr. Patty Lathan, who is amazing and wonderful, and was your uh, task force companion on the diabetes guidelines um, task force. And now you're here having finished uh, chairing, co-chairing the task force for the selected endocrinopathies of dogs and cats guidelines that are coming out in a few days from when we're recording this, which means they will be out and about um, and available for everyone to check out when this yeah. airs. So that's very exciting. How was that? It was, um, it was a big elephant to chew up. I tell you, yeah. it was, uh, it was really fun. Um, it was a fantastic group of people who love endocrinology. So you can imagine the level of nerdiness, um, working on, on that. <laughs> but I mean, because there is no, there's not really any in between, I don't think with endocrinology, I think you either love it and think it's super cool or wish that it would just go away. And, um, so it was, it was really, <laughs> it was really great to be among a bunch of, um, like-minded people who have a goal to make things easier for the, those of us who, um, maybe don't like endocrinology so much. Yeah, I think we talked about that when you and Patty were here and we were talking <laughs> about how like for some people it's like the best thing in the world when you get that pet that has like the three, it's like an internal medicine nightmare, has yeah. like three different things going on. You have to figure out how they all work together and how to manage them. And um, for other people, it's like that. Absolutely not. Like if there's anything you can right. do to turf that case, you're going to yeah. do it. <laughs> and how yeah. that's okay. <laughs> it is okay. It is okay. You don't because, have to do everything. Yeah. There are people who love that. And some of us would rather do a case like that than go into surgery any day. So. <laughs> right. right. Yep. True story. Um, so Renee, would you mind just uh, giving us, for people who haven't met you or been familiar with your work before, would you mind just giving us a little bit of background and how you came to be talking to me today on the podcast? Sure. I, um, well, first of all, I'm a University of Missouri graduate. So, um, you know, I'll, I'll say M I Z and hopefully I'll hear Z O U come out through the, uh, the atmosphere <laughs> somewhere. But, um, I have been doing uh, feline exclusive practice for the majority of my career. Um, I have been a board certified ABVP feline specialist since 2001 and um, have my own uh, regular wellness cat hospital, but we see a great deal of referral practice as well. Um, I also have a separate hyperthyroid radioactive iodine treatment center. So you know, between diabetes and um, hyperthyroidism, it's my my world has a lot of endocrinology in it. So yeah, um, so that's great. You know, we we do like seeing our our healthy cat friends too. But um, I love dogs. Um, I just uh, really really like being able to provide this kind of atmosphere, this quiet. Um, you know, usually pretty chill atmosphere for, for cats because they don't particularly like coming to see us. Cats definitely do have a specific set of needs that sometimes it's hard to meet when you have a building full of dogs, um, even with the best efforts. Yeah, so, absolutely. Yeah, that's super important. I feel like if I were to go back into practice, I would definitely consider feline practice. Um, I'm, you know, certainly no no specialist, but I feel like I understand cats, um, and and want them to, you know, I would always want to be around cats if I had the chance because I do like that quiet atmosphere. I do miss rolling around on the floor with dogs, though. You know, like I have a small dog, so I don't get to do that very much now that I'm not yeah. in practice. I do miss that. No, I totally miss that sometimes too. I mean, dogs are, are occasionally grateful for what you do yeah. as a veterinarian. And, <laughs> That's true. And, and cats, um, <laughs> cats really are, are very humbling. I, yeah. I, you know, I, I say all the time that I really truly believe that 
one of the, you know, a, a main purpose of cats that come into my life are to make me look bad. So um, <laughs> yeah. that that's, it's fine. It's an exercise in humility on a, you know, not- <laughs> every 20 minute basis. <laughs> it's the only way to send a cat home happy from the vet, right? As if they can make a fool out of you. <laughs> exactly. Exactly. They're so smug about it. Too. They and are. Yeah. I'm very rude, but it's- that's okay. Yeah. Well, and I guess it's dependent too, right? Because like my cat is more like a golden retriever than Mm. he's like a cat. He's real chill and he likes to slob all over you, you know, and he tries to eat your pizza crusts off your plate. And then my dog is a chihuahua and absolutely like doesn't want anything to do. So he's more of a cat. Yeah. Yeah, He's a cat dog. Yeah. 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 He, he would hate to hear that, but it's, it's true. So Eh, that's all right. You know, yeah, we're all, we've all got our stuff. We do. We do so much. (laughs) So I think that's why I relate to cats. You know, they're just like, they just tell you about their stuff and you just, you know, you, you gotta love them anyway. That's what I want. It's all out there. Somebody to love me anyway. So, um, so today we're here because um, it was actually your idea to do this this discussion, and I really loved that you suggested it because um, you had suggested that we talk about the new class of drugs out there uh, for to treat feline diabetes, um, and I think that's a, a really excellent idea. I'm sure a lot of people listening have heard talk about this, um, the, the drug that's on the market now. There's only one that's been approved so far, I believe, right? Um, yes, so far. And it, yeah, and the brand name is Bexacat, it's by Alenco. Right. And um, it, you know, I've seen a bunch of articles about it and stuff, most of which quoted you. <laughs> 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 um, because, like we were talking about before we got on, like you tend to be the one, everybody's heads just swivel and look at you when it comes yeah, to cat diabetes. <laughs> I don't know why. I mean, you know, there's a lot of, there's a lot of people who take care of diabetic cats. I, I, I don't know. I don't know if nobody else answers their emails or what, but <laughs> that is possible. Yeah, yeah, <laughs> yeah so. you are very responsive over email, and I will not print your email in the show notes in case people are getting <laughs> ideas. But you can email That's me, right. and I'll pass them on to Renee. I'm um, easily found. Yeah, <laughs> but um, I, you know, I love though. I love that because um, you know, when something new comes on, it's scary, and. Yeah. We're either going to jump right in and then use it potentially inappropriately, or we're all going to be a little scared of it and not use it well or enough um, because we're worried about it. And neither of those is a great scenario. So um, we're here today to sort of address some frequently asked questions or some potential FAQs um, that might help people feel a little bit more comfortable understanding what it is and how to use it. Good. Yeah. Okay. All right. So uh, I wrote down some FAQs and you contributed a couple. So... Let's okay. just jump right in. Okay. So can you tell us, we said we weren't going to discuss pharmacology too much, which is good. Yeah. Um, but I also think it's cool to kind of have a vague idea of how these things work. So can you just give a sort of nutshell version of how this drug is different, um, this class of drugs? Yeah. So so one of the things that, so it's a um, SGLT2 inhibitor. So that stands for sodium glucose co-transporter two. Um, that's, that's too many words for me. I, I, if, you know, if anybody, <laughs> anybody knows me, whether it's my clients or my staff or, or, um, veterinarians, I give lectures to, I, I really, I hate doctor words. Um, I, I would just rather, you know, not work that hard. So I can use them if I have to, um, but I'd rather not. So we're just going to call it SGLT2 inhibitors. One of the things that, um, people have mentioned to me as, as the, the news of this comes out, you know, colleagues of mine, veterinarians in the area that I may or may not meet for beers or something, but they, they, they're like, Oh, the new insulin pill, the new insulin pill. It is absolutely not an insulin pill. Um, it is a completely different type of, of drug. And so, um, what this drug does is it, reduces, it reduces blood glucose levels. And so for it to work, the body still has to be making insulin. So we don't need to go into all of that, but we can go into that a little bit when we talk about how to, how to choose which cat is appropriate for this type of drug. Um, but it probably the easiest way to think about it. So typically when, 
there is a high blood glucose level. It gets filtered through the kidneys a little bit and, um, and then the kidneys resorb it back up. The way this drug works just kind of as an easy way to think about it is if you think about the blood throat, blood flow through the kidney as being like a freeway and, um, the glucose is, is traveling down the, the highway in a normal kidney, it gets off at all the exits and goes back into wherever it needs to go with Bexacat or with whatever other, um, drug that, that comes out within this drug class, the off ramps are blocked. So, so the glucose isn't going to get back into the bloodstream. It is going to go right into the urine instead. So instead of going back in and continually causing that blood glucose level to be high, the, the, the animal, whether it's a human or a cat or whatever, is able to clear that excessive glucose into the urine, which is going to be a whole different way of looking at these things. Mm. Cause in the past with the previous diabetic guidelines, we talked about using glucose, um, uh, urine glucose measurements yeah. to help monitor these cats. And that's yeah. just not going to be right. It's, you're going to freak out if you do right. that. <laughs> right. These cats are always going to be um, glucose uric. So that's a whole different way of um, thinking about these things. And it's going to be, it, there's, there's going to be a learning curve. There's going to be some getting used to using this drug. Yeah, that's really interesting. And I was just thinking about that, how the, the diabetes guidelines, you know, from, was it, I think, 2018? Um, yeah, I think so. You had, the task force had specifically said, we don't really recommend using oral drugs because this drug, this class of drugs wasn't out at that right. time. And then it also said, you know, you can monitor the, the glucose in the urine. And there are all these things available now to do that, like strips and special litter and like a mat, you know, that goes under the lid. And like none of that would work in this case um, because it'll always be full of sugar. And right. I was thinking about, you know, the reasons why we think about sugar in the urine other than just it signals high blood sugar to us. But um, does that make these cats more prone to UTI? Yeah, you know, when I first started, um, working with Alonco on this, it, 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 that was my big concern too. It was like, okay, mm -hmm. great. So now we're going to have, you know, fat cats that are messy anyway. And are, you know, <laughs> now we're going to create this perfect medium for bacteria to grow. The, the initial studies have not shown that to be an issue. So, um, which I was relieved about it. I, I think, you know, the, we'll see what happens mm -hmm. as time goes on. Um, but at this point in time, it doesn't seem to be, uh, you know, the biggest concern there, I think it is on the label that, you know, to be concerned about that because it is, right. it does seem like it would be a perfect storm, but, um, but, but in, in real life, it's, uh, hopefully not going to be as big of an issue as we might be concerned about. That's good. Cats defy expectation anyway. So totally. Of of course, if we're expecting it, then they're not, they're going to be like, Psh, no, we're fine. Right. Yeah. What else? Yeah. <laughs> yeah. We got this. <laughs> you might be worried about that, but we're right. not. <laughs> <laughs> but now you have to throw out those eight boxes of test strips you bought. <laughs> the, uh, there's still going to be a lot of cats on insulin. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> well, yes. And so that's the next question, right? Is what, how do we know what cases are appropriate? Because clearly this isn't a drug that everybody's recommending instead of insulin for diabetic cats in general. Yeah. Yeah. So the patient selection for this class of drugs is going to be imperative. And um, the, because back to what I initially said, the, the, the cat still needs to have a source of insulin, so if, if you think of, um, the big fat cats being more like a, a type two diabetic where there's just, they're, they're really insulin resistant, mm -hmm. um, not insulin deficient. Right. So the, that insulin is still being produced by the pancreas. It's still trying to get to where it needs to get and do its job. It's, there's just so much resistance there. So we want these cats to be healthy cats. They, um, these are the cats that 
come in for their regular annual or semi-annual visits that we notice that they have lost weight or the people notice that they've been losing weight, but they're, they're eating really well and they're, they're still drinking great. And they, Oh man, they pee like everything. I mean, they're, they're, they're doing great doc. And, and, you know, we as veterinarians are like, Ooh, you know, it sounds like, sounds like they might be diabetic. And, um, and so they don't come in with the problems of vomiting. They don't come in, um, the, with, um, a plant grade stance normally, because those cats will have been sick for a while. They don't come in with concurrent pancreatitis. They are just these cats that, um, we are diagnosing diabetes almost incidentally. Um, so when you really think about the cats that come in that we diagnose as diabetic, how many of them are coming in without other clinical signs? You know, not, not that many. So, um, so those cats are still going to need to, to be on insulin if they're sick at all, because we, we just don't have a way to measure insulin production in cats that's mm. efficient and cost effective. And, you know, so, so um, we're going to have to use other means to, to make sure that we, pick the right cats. So if a cat comes in sick, um, you know, or at least moderately sick, you know, I would say the majority of cats that I've seen anyway and diagnosed as new diabetics were like kind of sick, you know, not like the DKA emergency, but not like the fat cat that the owner's finally excited. They're not going to get lectured about the cat's weight. And then you're like, Oh yeah. (laughs) But those moderately sick cats who clearly aren't well, but they're like managing and they're still Mm -hmm. eating and stuff. If those cats go on insulin, will is there a chance that they'll eventually be able to transition over or once a cat's on insulin, it's on insulin. And it's once, once the cat is on insulin, then then that's it. These are okay. this, this class of drugs at, at this point in time and probably for the foreseeable future. Um, the, the, this class of drugs is purely for the, the brand new, newly diagnosed diabetic cat. Okay. Um, what about complications? Like what do we need to worry about when it comes to this drug? Say we've picked the right patient Mm -hmm. um, and the case is right, but are there complications or side effects that we should watch for or warn people about um, once we start to use it? Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, so the cool thing about this class of drugs is that we don't have the normal diabetic cat on insulin complication. The odds of a cat becoming hypoglycemic on this class of drugs is, is practically zero, which is amazing. Absolutely amazing. Um, but the, the flip side of that is, is that when they do get sick, we can't necessarily look at hyperglycemia as being one of the red flags. So the, um, the complications are, are, mainly that they will, they will mainly occur if for some reason the cat is no longer producing enough endogenous insulin. So that would be diabetic ketoacidosis, which is going to be a little bit more um, challenging to, to potentially diagnose because they're not going to be hyperglycemic. So the, the phrase euglycemic diabetic ketoacidosis is going to be a, a much more mm. prominent in the, in the vernacular because um, these cats are going to potentially be very, very sick with ketones, um, but normoglycemic. Okay, so ketones in the urine can still be a diagnostic aid there, um, or is that something that we might see anyway in these cats? You shouldn't see ketones in the urine on one that's doing well, but because the main monitoring, um, instant monitoring with these yeah. guys is a ketone level, um, the recommendation, if, if people don't have them in their hospitals already, is to have a handheld um, ketone monitor. Uh, mm. BHB is the ketone that we're looking at, and 
and people are like, Oh my God, I don't, I don't know what that is. So if you, if you, if you work on cows at all, you know what these things are. You know, this <laughs> is, this is, I'm like, this, this sounds so familiar. I know, right? It's like you dig it out of the bowels. It was 15 of your years ago or whatever. Right? <laughs> so the cool about. thing, the cool <laughs> thing about these little handheld, uh, ketone meters is that they look just like, um, your, your bedside glucometer. Huh. Um, it's, it's basically the same little machine. It's a little, it's one drop of blood. Um, it's an instant read. And those, that's what we're going to use to monitor these guys, both before we start potentially. And then, um, as you start the initial treatment. Very cool. Yeah. It is close. cool. Another little gadget that you get to have in your clinic. <laughs> right. And they're, and they're very inexpensive. Although um, I, I was talking, I was speaking with somebody this weekend that said that you used to be able to get them from our distributors for about um, $25 to $30. Mm. And now they're like $45 to $50. Of course. But, you know, <laughs> it's really for, for lab monitoring equipment that we need to have. I mean, that's, that's yeah. really nothing in the whole scheme of things. And I truly believe that you you should not be using this drug without one of those in your hospital. Because if you have to send it out to a reference lab um, and it takes 24 to 36 hours or more to get that back, that cat could be in really, really bad shape. So you have to have this in your hospital if you're going to start treating these cats with this kind of drug. Oh, that's really good to know. It's like a starter kit for mm-hmm. <laughs> for starting yeah. out this, with this drug. And Absolutely. is there a human... like? Are there ketone meters for humans and ones for animals? Um, or is this something we don't usually use in human medicine? No, I, um, there are a couple that are, are for animals. I've got, I've got one brand. Um, I think the, the drug companies are, are coming out or, and recommending another. There's at least a couple of different brands right now. Okay. Yeah, I'm, pi- I'm picturing because it happens now with the glucometers, right? I'm picturing the clients coming in and being like, I have one, you know, and not having any right. clue whether it's good or not. <laughs> yeah. Um, and I don't, I don't know. I, I, there's gotta be something for humans. I'm just not familiar yeah. with that. Maybe it's for people on the old school Atkins diet. I think you were supposed to measure your, the ketones oh, right. your when you're on Atkins. It's like, yeah, really ringing a bell. I think, I think with the, and I think <laughs> ongoing, ha, you know, definitely having people look at ketones in the urine, that's, that's fine at home. Yeah. Um, but there's going to be a lag time, right. Mm-hmm. But b- between when you start seeing those ketones, um, go up in the bloodstream versus yeah. when they're in the urine. So, yeah. But. Um, do you see cats going to remission on this drug? Mm. What's remission? <laughs> right, that's true. So, yeah, so that, not need so, the drug anymore. I should say. Right. So, so, so typically, um, you know, when we're talking about cats on insulin, we talk about diabetic remission being when they don't need insulin anymore. Right, that's like the easiest way to define it. Mm-hmm. Um, so, will they go into remission on this? I don't know. I don't know. Um, you know, is it something where this is an opportunity where we can start this drug, we can really aggressively work on weight loss and diet change and other things without that inherent risk of administering insulin twice a day, right? So maybe when we're able to work on everything else that's contributing to that cat's diabetes, we can take them off of this drug, um, is that the same as, um, remission? I don't, you know, I think that's, I think it's going to be a little bit of a, a shift in definition at some point, but yeah. so can we get them off, off the drug? I don't see why we wouldn't be able to, if we take care of all the reasons why they were diabetic in the first place. Yeah. And it seems like that's something that, um, a fair number of owners might actually be able to relate to because type two diabetes is pretty, you know, it's not uncommon um, in right. human adults. And um, a lot of people take oral drugs for that. And right. at some point with lifestyle changes could potentially go off of medication. And that might be something that owners could relate to. Well, um, I'm just thinking about after 
decades. Yeah. <laughs> I don't know how long after decades of hammering into owners about insulin and remission and the blood sugar monitoring and all the things. And like now we're coming in here with this pill and saying like, right. we're going to do this instead. How, right. what do we need to make sure, what conversations do we need to make sure we have with clients before we start this? Well, I think, you know, just to go back to, you know, talking to clients and diagnosing this before we talk about what, what we tell them, I mean, you think about just what we've had to go through educating Mm -hmm. cat owners about the potential of their cat being diabetic. And, and you, you know, most, most every cat needs twice a day insulin. So that's a, a lifestyle lifestyle change for the cat. It's a lifestyle change for the human. So now they've got to be home you know, maybe not on the dot every 12 hours, but they need to be home when, when they can administer this drug and make sure that cat ate and, you know, all the things, right? Yeah. And very so stressful. Then, very stressful. And then the cat's like, why are you watching me? Stop, <laughs> stop watching me, you know, leave me alone. And if there's you, one thing that's going to make a cat act weird. Right. <laughs> Potentially and as, sick. You know, as, Right. And as as much as we explain to owners that this needle is tiny and the cats typically don't care, there are still people that are afraid of needles. And there are Mm -hmm. still cats that are like, yeah, no, I don't want to get poked twice a day. So then that affects the relationship between the owner and their pet. And then, you know, even before it starts affecting their relationship, once people just hear the diagnosis of diabetes, you know, there's a fair number of cats that will get euthanized at that point or sometime within the first several months of being on insulin and all the, uh, you know, the changes and do we have the right dose yet? And do we this and do we that? And so the opportunity to have a once a day chewable medication that they can either break up and, and take like a treat or get mixed in food with no risk of hypoglycemia and no chasing the cat around the house and ruining that relationship, you know, if the cat's a good candidate for it, I mean, I think that's, that's going to be a complete game changer. So the, the question was, you know, how do we educate the, the clients about this? You know, the, the fact that it doesn't always have to, be with a meal and they don't have to have caro syrup. Um, right. I mean, golly, I mean, I hope everybody who has stock in caro syrup sells it now because I mean, it's just going <laughs> to crash. Right. Right. Um, but it's, it's, uh, it's, it's going to be a, a different sort of, of education. So now instead of spending all of our time educating on how to give um, insulin and the timing and the storage and the, all of that, we're going to be talking about just monitoring that cat for how they're feeling. Because if they start feeling icky, is it because of something else or is it because they're developing DKA? And it's not that common. The development of DKA is not that common with the cats that are on this drug. But when it happens, it like any DKA, it needs to be addressed super quickly. And so you know, having the owners be aware that that's a complication. If they have to go to the emergency vet who may not know yet, you know, that these cats aren't going to be hyperglycemic, it's going to be really important to get that message out too. Care Credit and Pets Best are proud to sponsor this podcast. They believe Pride Month is an important time each year to reflect and motivate individuals to advance fairness and equality and empower all people to be their authentic selves regardless of sexual orientation, gender identity, or expression. The Care Credit Credit Card and Pets Best are here with friendly, flexible solutions to empower all types of pet parents to be financially prepared for a lifetime of care. Absolutely, yeah. So anybody who works at an ER who's listening to this, remember, like, don't right. assume that a diabetic cat that comes in crashing is going to have a high blood sugar if they're if they're yeah. on DKA, because if exactly. they're on an oral drug like Bexicat, then 
it could potentially be DKA without hyperglycemia. I feel like that's got to be right. the key message of today. It is, yeah. And <laughs> yeah, and there's and even though their their blood sugar is normal, they're still going to have to give them insulin. You know, oh, they, yeah. they still need insulin to fix that problem. So, oh gosh, yeah, yeah. I, I'm picturing the mindset of that ER vet being like. I know, right? It's, it's, I think for a while it's going to be really, really weird, and I'm worried yeah. about some cats, you know. But, um, but it it'll you know we'll all get through it, and um, you know it's still a, a really good option for a lot of diabetic cats. So um, I actually did a podcast with um, my brother. And his wife, who have a diabetic cat, Audrey. She's in remission now. Shout out to yeah. Audrey. Um, and she was on insulin. And my my sister in law is one of those people who like mm. in the room with the needle. Like they told mm. a story about her like in the fetal position, clutching a stuffed animal, like when she right. had to get her flu shot. And you know, she's the one who ended up being a ninja at getting blood from Audrey to check her blood sugar. But it was a, yeah. I mean she had to really, it was like, she had to overcome the mental battle of like, this is for her. This is what she needs. But I am guessing that if they could have had a pill, because Audrey, I believe is also in, um, Apoquel. Mm. <laughs> it's off label. Don't do what we do. Right. <laughs> um, it's what I, yeah. <laughs> um, I, you know, I, I am sure they would have loved to have that option. Now, yeah. I don't know if she would have been a candidate at the time. Um, I, I don't remember that detail, but, um, I could just imagine the relief um, that my sister-in-law would have felt if she had heard about the diabetes and then heard that she did not have to learn to to be okay with needles. No matter how tiny, yeah. she did not want them. <laughs> yeah, I mean it's it's huge. It's yeah. it's a it's an amazing option. Um, it really is. I I think you know it's it's really going to be a potential game changer. Yeah. So how do we um, make sure that vet teams, so the vet team at the hospital that might be prescribing the drug and then vet teams, say, who are checking the patient in at the ER um, and potentially having to relay the message that this cat is on this drug, how do we train the teams um, to be aware and, and know what's important for them to know? Yeah, I think there's two... Um two main levels to that. So, you know, how many times, um, as veterinarians, you know, we're not, we're not always the first people in the building. Right. So our, our front desk team has come in in the morning and they have received a phone call from, you know, um, uh, whoever, uh, whoever's owner, um, Max's owner who says, Oh my God, you know, Max, um, he, he just won't eat this morning. So do I give him his insulin? Do I, you know, do I, do I do this? You know, and, and then you have to go through, well, you know, they need to, they need to eat and blah, 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 blah. Don't give the insulin. So now, you know, th- that risk of becoming hypoglycemic is gone. So our, our front desk staff needs to know that all this training that they've had to prevent hypoglycemia is, doesn't apply to the SGLT2 inhibitor class of drugs. So, so there's that. So they can talk people off the ledge a little bit when it comes to that. But the, the flip side of that is that if this cat continues to take his um, SGLT2 inhibitor and isn't feeling well, and maybe it wasn't just the, you know, I vomited this morning because I, I um, ate a bug or whatever it is, but this cat is really sick, um, that it's not going to be a problem with having to, to stop the Bex cat per se, just because their blood sugar is too low. But those are the cats that we need to come in and say, you know what, we need to do a spot check at least of this ketone and, and just double, double check everything. As far as going to the ER, um, I, I believe that, um, the, the, client information pack and like travel pack kind of stuff is, was a little bit delayed coming from Alonco and then, you know, whatever companies come after this with this kind of drug, I think that there will be um, something that the owners can always have with them to help inform uh, the emergency staff, you know, going forward to make sure that, that everybody is set, set up for success. 
That makes so much sense. I was just thinking, like, how do you put a medic alert bracelet on a cat? Well, <laughs> exactly. My cat won't even wear a collar, so. <laughs> right. I mean, wouldn't it be cool if we could put all that on a microchip, right? It but, would. But, you One know, day. Ha- <laughs> right. Had, but having, you know, like QR codes or something that's stuck to the carrier, yeah. I, I don't know how they're going to do it. But um, but I think that that, that is going to be key until this becomes a more um, uh, common common drug to use. So if the cat, I just have a couple more, I'm just thinking about, um, I don't even work in a clinic now, but if I did, (laughs) these are the questions that I would have. And so in terms of, um, a cat who comes in on with, you know, vomiting and is sick and turns out to be DKA, um, is that, and then that cat needs insulin at the hospital, even though they're euglycemic. Yeah. Is that cat ever going to go home on Bexacat again, or is that cat now on insulin? No, that cat will now be on insulin. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Um, and, you know, I I feel like there's a fair number of owners who cannot afford a DKA hospitalization. You know, yeah. it's like if it gets to that point, they're just they're just not going to be able to continue, which isn't wrong. It's just a, you know, it's, it's a just spectrum the way it of is. care. Yeah. yeah. Um, and so I'm seeing, like, you know, these cats come in – good candidate, healthy, you know, feeling cat other other than showing some signs that are suspicious, turns out to be diabetic, started on Bexacat because the owners are pretty tight on funds. And they're saying, well, I don't have the money to not only start insulin, but do all the glucose curves, you know, the serial glucoses that we need to do. Yeah. That's, I'm assuming that when you start a, Bexa, a cat on Bexacat, you just send it home. And tell the owners what to watch for versus having to have the cat come in and do some extensive monitoring the way that you would if you started on insulin. Is that right? Um, It's just different. You know, it's different. So you will have done your regular workup to see if the Mm -hmm. cat's diabetic, including checking um, for any evidence of pancreatitis, because any evidence Mm -hmm. of pancreatitis makes us worried, you know, what, how much insulin is being produced. Right. Right. So assuming it's the good candidate, right. So we're going to make sure that we're not, um, that their BHB levels are, um, not elevated because we don't want to start a cat on this drug if their ketones are starting to creep up. And then, um, and then we're going to have that cat come in So, so for instance, for, for me, I, I try to start these cats on a Monday you know, if I can, um, or a Friday would be fine also, to be honest, but regardless, you want to get these cats back in three to five days after you've started the drug and just do that bedside, uh, ketone meter check just to make sure that everything is cool. And as we're starting to learn this new class of drugs and monitoring, um, we're going to ask that those cats come back relatively frequently for the first little bit. So two weeks, four to six weeks, eight weeks. And then if, if everything seems to be plugging right along at that point, then we can go a little bit longer, but it's not that, that this, you know, just because it's not insulin, isn't going to be, it's not going to, to mean that, that diabetic cats aren't still an investment. Yeah. You know, I mean, they're still sick cats, right? They still have a major disease. So we have to monitor that. Um, And just like diabetic cats that are on insulin, um, they still need to be monitored even once they're, they've got their right dose where the difference is going to be is that there's just one dose, right? Mm -hmm. So it's not that when they come in, we're trying to do um, dose changes and, and tweak things here and there and all that sort of stuff. Um, so that could potentially be a little bit of a financial savings, but, yeah. um, but you still have to pay close attention to these cats without a doubt. Do you think we'll see a time once we're a little more comfortable with the drug where we send ketone meters home with owners the way that we do glucometers now and have them check ketones at home? Absolutely. Yeah. yeah, I don't. I um, don't have to see why we why we wouldn't. Yeah, it's not going to be just like with handheld glucometers. It's not going to be 
um, a replacement for our regular workups, but right. it will definitely be one of those things where owners can check that at home and, you know, decide whether this is, oh my gosh, this is a panic right. moment and we need to go right away or, okay, I, I have a little breathing room to figure out if it's something else. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, it's just a whole new world, isn't it? It like, is. Just... <laughs> does it make you want to sing, you know? Like, uh, like, yes. Like, I mean, um, it does. <laughs> and yeah. a lot of needle phobic cat people. <laughs> Yeah, I I think it's I think it's super exciting. I you know, my my biggest concern um is that that patient selection won't won't be as careful as it needs to be. You know, I think that mm-hmm. because it's not a needle, because it's a pill, because it's once a day, because there's no risk of hypoglycemia, I think that there's going to be a lot of pressure. I think there's going to be a lot of pressure from the owners, you know, when they hear about this, they are going to want this and not insulin. And they're, you know, some people are really hard to say no to, right? Yeah. Um, so there's going to be a lot of pressure. There's going to be pressure from your, um, your distributors, right? You know, your distributors are going to come in and say, oh, we've got this great new drug and, and, you know, you should put all your diabetic cats on this. Hopefully they won't be like that, but you know what I mean? You know, it's yeah. a very slippery slope. And then your staff, I think, um, your staff and other doctors in the hospital are going to be like, well, why, don't, why don't we do this? This is going to be so much easier. And I, I think that it's going to require a lot of um, potentially a lot of saying no, you know, and yeah. sticking up for the patient. And is this the best thing? And no, you know, it, the answer is going to be no. And I'm, I'm really sorry, but I don't want to kill your cat. You know, I I think we can be that blunt about it. If we choose incorrectly, the cat will not survive. So that's not meant to sound ominous. It's it's just we have to be so careful. Yeah, and really, there are so many cats who are who live happy lives either on insulin or post insulin. You know, like Audrey is so happy and so. It's not like insulin is the big bad bear that we're so glad to be rid of, but it's certainly, this hopefully will provide a lot more cats with the ability to stay happy and healthy with diabetes because we've all been in the room and thought like, oh, I don't want to euthanize this cat now. Like he looks good. And insulin was just absolutely a no-go. And then it's just a matter of like, do we wait until he's suffering to do it or do it now? And that is such a, that's the moral distress in that situation is so hard, but I can see exactly what you're saying. I can feel myself in that, you know, in that situation where, especially for newer vets who may not be in a Mm. position to um, assert themselves, you know, in a practice, they feel pressure to do things the way the other doctors who are more experienced are doing them. And there's a doctor in the practice who might be the owner. We all know Mm -hmm. how it goes who might be like handing Bexa cat out like candy to the diabetic cats. And, um, and that is going to be a challenge, but um, we, we figured it out. A lot of us figured it out with, when it came to steroids (laughs) (laughs) and, um, (laughs) and we can figure this out too. (laughs) So um, absolutely. It's important. I, I think it's just like, you know, when we, when we put out the, the diabetes guidelines a few years ago, one of the main aspects of that was that there is no, um, perfect way to monitor, right? There is no perfect, there's no perfect anything, right? So, so having this class of drugs come out, the SGLT2 inhibitors, I I think it just gives us another option, right? I mean, um, you know, you, a, a, a baseball pitcher has, you know, four or five different pitcher pitches he can throw based on the kind of batter that's up. Right. So you don't, you don't throw a fastball to a fastball hitter. Right. So, so this is kind of one of those sorts of things, you know, you have insulin, you maybe there are cats that you can, um, correct their hyperglycemia by putting them on a, a high protein, all can diet, you know, maybe that's good enough. Maybe another cat gets it's an SGLT2 inhibitor, you know, so it's just, it's, it's another tool in our ever growing arsenal of how to take the best care of our patients. Yeah. 
Absolutely. I love that. And it's very exciting. Like it is. It is it exciting. Feels, it feels like we're it's it's a new era of di- feline diabetes. And right. it's it's a big deal. I mean, I was around when, you know, it was a new era for treating allergies, you know, we just talked about that a little bit and you didn't have to give everybody steroids. That was a big deal. Um, and this is a big, big deal. So I'm sure we'll be seeing more drugs in this class come out and, um, and I'll be yeah. really excited to be, to see updates, um, from not just you, although <laughs> <laughs> definitely from you, <laughs> um, yeah. where there's endocrine disease, there is. Yeah. Right. <laughs> Absol- right. Absolutely. That sounds bad. No, yeah. <laughs> It's like you never you never wish a disease process on anything, right? Yeah. But, but since we have this available, you know, I, we we see my associate and I we see on the appointments, you know, like oh, drinking more, losing. More. We're like, Ooh. you know, yeah. can we can we try it? Can we try it? And um, and then I'm like, oh my god, what's wrong with us? Why <laughs> you know why are we? But it is. It's just it's just so. Um, it's just really, really cool to be able to do something different yeah. that um, we, ha- we have a recent, recently diabetic, um, newly diabetic cat who um, it's been a client for forever. Or it's been a patient. Her owner has been a client for forever. And um, there is no way that this owner, I, I mean, I shouldn't say no way. Cause we always say that, right. There's yeah. no way she could have given insulin. She would have figured it out. Right. Yeah. But the, the fact that the, her cat came in and was the perfect candidate for this, you could just see her face relax. You could see um, her blood pressure go down when we said your cat is diabetic because she immediately thought, Oh my God, I'm going to have to do insulin. And then when, when she found out that that, didn't have to be her only option. It it just felt, it just felt so good on so many levels. So we are optimistic that this cat continues to do well. She's doing great so far. Um, And just, just, it's just kind of fun. You know, sometimes it's fun to be a vet. It's not often that you get to have something new to offer people that can really offer hope um, in in a place where there might not have been any anymore. And that is just really it's a it's a great feeling. So um, I can totally relate to the idea of like waiting for that case to come in, even though you don't want any cats to have to have diabetes, but they're going to have diabetes anyway. Uh, You know, it's going to happen. Diabetes happens. So if they do happen. It's it's great to have something new and and pretty revolutionary to offer. So it is. It is. Um, I will say in the guidelines that you were recently the one of the chairs for the task force, the selected endocrinopathies of dogs and cats um, that is coming out here in a few days, um, and feline diabetes is not in there. <laughs> so right. um, so you're just showing your well rounded endocrinopathy prowess, um, right? But, yeah, that's um, what it is. <laughs> but it's because diabetes is such a big topic, you know, it has its own guidelines for a reason. And that guideline will be updated at some point in the future. And I'm sure we'll contain information about this class of drugs. But in the yeah. meantime, um, people you know, this is a, this podcast is a good reference. There have been a lot of articles out about it. Um, and is there any place that you would recommend people go to get more information about it or just kind of like stock VIN boards and cause you're good, we're going to have to learn from each other's experience. I mean, I, I honestly, I think the, the company and, you know, future companies that are making this drug, I, I think they're going to be the a really good resource. Um, I would yeah. say come to AHA Con and um, yes. hear a lecture about it. I, somebody an excellent might, idea. Somebody might be giving a lecture. Um, <laughs> yeah, I, I can't imagine who. <laughs> <laughs> um, and uh, yeah, and just you know, pay attention. I, I think that yeah. I think that the discussion on this will be um, vigorous and. Yeah. Uh, just knowing, knowing that, you know, opinions are like everything we know, right. You know, everybody's got one and, um, and just, just be ready to, uh, be open minded and, and remember that case selection is going to be the most important thing about this. And I, I think, um, I, my concern is that 
you know, people are going to not choose wisely and have a bad experience and then give up on it completely. Um, and I, I hope that doesn't happen. And, um, cause I do think that, that it is a, a relatively safe medication when used correctly, yeah. like any, like any other medication. Right. Great to know. It's not the thing to send home just in case. Like, just because no. you got to do something. <laughs> Don't no, do no, no, no. <laughs> yeah. Um, I think everybody, when they heard there was a new diabetes drug that came out, I think everybody was hoping it would be that drug. <laughs> you yeah, know, that right. you could just send home. Like, oh, you can't afford any diagnostics, take this pill. But right. as of now, <laughs> right, <laughs> yeah, it's three bucks. Um, okay, well, Renee, one last question before I let you go. Um, you know, You've now been on the task force for multiple AHA guidelines, and we greatly appreciate that. You know, we the the guidelines are are such a valuable resource to be a guiding light for our vet teams and, and putting best best practices um, into their own hospitals and adapting them as they need to for their own teams and and clients and patients. And you know, we call them guidelines because everybody's got a little bit of a different way of using them. And we all have something that guides us on our journey as veterinary professionals. And I was just wondering, what is it that guides you? It's such a big question after we've talked about all these heavy things, right? So yeah. what a, what a, what a, a gear switch. Um, what guides me? I, I think um, in a, in a general sense, I think, I try to, um, I try to just be nice. You know, I, I think that, um, if you use that as your, your grounding point, you can't go too terribly wrong, right? Not everybody's always having a good day. People are grumpy. You can always be kind, right? Um, but I think as far as, um, you know, being a part of helping the write the guidelines and and other things, I think it goes to um, uh, one of my favorite lines is if if I can't if I can't change the world, I can at least change the world within my reach, right? So if I can continue to spread what I know to um, other veterinarians who might want to learn that. I don't know everything. I'm never going to know everything. I am never going to be the best um, person to talk to about cat diabetes or other endocrine things. Right. You know, I mean, I, I know some stuff and I can, I can, (laughs) I can, um, I can share what I know, but, um, but by helping with the, with, with AHA or, or with, you know, talking to other veterinarians and, and educational things, I, it allows me to change the world for cats within mm-hmm. my reach. And, um, you know, what I've learned over the years, and I might have said this on, on the other pag- podcast that we did with um, Dr. Lathan, but I don't think, I think there are a lot of vets who don't particularly like cats. Um and that's, that's okay. I mean, truth be told, I don't particularly like horses, so I don't work on them. <laughs> right. Yeah. Um, and so, um, I think it's important to, to really help the people who do like cats, uh, to fit, to figure out how to best help this. There's still a neglected, um, portion of veterinary medicine, even though we have all these drugs coming out that are finally approved for cats, we have cat hospitals, we have cat specialists that presumably like to work on, on cats. You know, we, we still have to help change, change the world for our cat patients. Yeah, I think you're right. People love cats, so they're just not that into them. And uh, it's kind of like endocrine diseases. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> You're not that into them. Um, right. And cats with endocrine di- diseases just exacerbate that, I'm sure, for people right. that aren't cat people. So yeah, we just we just have pillows <laughs> against um, our, 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 you know, one pillow against the wall in every room so we can just bang our head on it. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. And the cat's like, that's right. <laughs> right. Yeah. I made you do that. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> well, Renee, I can say uh, as far as being kind, being nice, like, 
they're not always the same thing. And uh, sometimes being too nice gets you signed up for too many task forces. So I think you're doing a good job. But uh, (laughs) but we, I think... I think goal achieved there because um, everybody that I talk to, whenever I say, oh, I get to talk to Renee Rosinski, they say she's amazing. And um, I absolutely agree. Talking to you is a pleasure. And I'm very glad that you uh, are, have been such a great friend to AHA and that we'll get to see you again in San Diego in September. Well, thank you. I I appreciate that. And I hope you can um, uh, adjust the, uh, the, the, the lighting or whatever, because I feel like I'm, I'm bright right now. So I I appreciate the kind, the kind words. Thank you so much. Absolutely. Thank you so much for your time today. And um, for everybody listening, um, completely unrelated to this podcast, because cat diabetes is nowhere in it. um, (laughs) Definitely check out the new uh, the 2023 AHA selected endocrinopathies of dogs and cats guidelines. It is the first um, first guidelines on that topic, and it is out now. You can find it at aha.org slash endocrine dash disease. So. It is a captivating read. It, oh, yeah. <laughs> 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 yeah, I mean, there's a ton of information in there. So, there is. It's a um, lot. Yeah, absolutely. Take, you know, get take some time going through it. Um, there's a lot of stuff in there, but it's there as a reference for you and your team to use. It's free to the whole profession. So um, a lot of work from the task force uh, headed up in part by Dr. Renee Rosinski, who we are so pleased to have today. Thank you so much for your time. Thank and you. We'll see you in September. Sounds good. Sounds Thanks good. To all see you, you there. For listening. Yeah, we'll catch you next time on Central Line. <laughs>